All right. It's been a very, very busy weekend. Started out Friday, did the raffle with Sinister Monopoly. We're raising money for my Narcan initiative. Um, and it looks like I'm making a lot of progress in that. We're going to officially start a GoFundMe after we make the snake ordinance blotter shirts, hooded sweatshirts. But right now I'm, I'm looking for volunteers. I'm looking for people that can be in charge of the mailing, um, organizational stuff, and people that are willing to call other organizations, whether that be big you know, corporate restaurants, whoever you think you might be able to get sponsor what we're trying to do. Let's just get Narcan to everyone that needs it in the country for free because that's like a real tangible way to affect change. Um, Paul passed away and it affected me in a way that I never knew I could be affected by a loss. You know, I cry pretty frequently and I'm not the kind of guy that cries a lot. You know, I've been jaded by prison. I've been jaded by addiction. I've lost people that I cared about. I mean, I lost Jenny. She was my ex and she was a really good person. Um, I lost her, but nothing had the impact like Paul did. He was a brother to me. I'm an only child and losing him um, was just devastating. You know, he's a really, really great guy. Um, and it hits me. It hits me. At random times, you know, I, I just miss him. And I don't know, There's it's just the worst feeling in the world to really miss somebody that you care about to that degree. So I think helping people get Narcan for free is the best thing I can do in his honor. I'm also making him an honorary executive producer for my documentary, and I'm donating some of the proceeds that I would be getting to his fiance. You know, and I hope that the film does really well. I hope it gets a lot of residuals and she's getting checks for the rest of her life because I know that Paul would love to know that he's taking care of her in some way just because they cross paths. And I'm, I'm happy that I can do that. Please like, comment, subscribe. Um, do whatever you got to do to engage. Check out the Patreon. The link will be in the pinned comments in the description. Um, I'm really grateful for everyone that's helping me out in, in any way. And this Narcan thing is something I want to do, but it's a collective effort. You know, I need it with you guys. The bigger the channel grows, the, the more people we can get involved with that effort as well. And I just hope it's something that, that we can do and that it's all symbiotic with the channel, the film, the book, and with the charitable effort to get Narcan to people that need it everywhere. You know, they shouldn't be charging money for that. That's bullshit. I think we all know that. So, geez, sorry for the for the gloomy opening. I've actually tried to do this video like 15 times, probably more than that, like 20, 30 times, and I just keep messing up. Sometimes I, I mess up a lot, and it's always like in the first three or four minutes, you know? And I think at some point I'll put all the bloopers on Patreon or something. But let's get into the story. That wasn't that bad. Come on. It was only three minutes and 30 seconds. So where I was last time, I was in Lompoc. And I was working out in the indoor gym. Now, I had this workout partner, and I had this other workout. We had, I had two workout partners. There were three of us. And we worked out together. And we were in the indoor gym. There was a guy on the elliptical. Remember, he was doing his thing. And this Southsider, the J-Cat Southsider, gets behind him. Stands about this close to him. So say the guy's in the elliptical like there, he's like standing like him. I mean, like he's like boner distance away from this guy. Like, dude, a sex ride could pop off with one boner. That's how close he is. But in, in all seriousness, he's about that close to him. And the guy's making these like galloping sexual, um, you know, motions. It was very, very bizarre. And my workout partner sees him and he's like, hey, what are you doing? You're a weirdo. Well, he yells at him. Now these other Southsiders come. Now it turns into this bigger thing. I'm there with my workout partner with both of them. So there's three of us. And there's about nine Southsiders that essentially start moving towards us. They're like, listen, he's a J-cat. He's a little slow. He's not all the way there. He's autistic. Whatever they're telling us, it's clear that my workout partner, the really aggro one, is just seeing straight red. You know, uh, He's just like, oh, it's unacceptable. It's un then you deal with him. You deal with them right now. And they're like, whoa. Check, you're not going to tell us how to deal with our with our own people, okay? It will be dealt with, but we're not doing anything you tell us to do. So for a minute, 
gets very uh, volatile. And that's when I was doing the Mad Dog, you know, trying to have them not see my color tattoos. It was uh, symptomatic of being soft, my emo shit, you know. Standing there, mad dogging them, and eventually the Southsiders are just like, listen, if you want to do something, we can do it right here. We said we're sorry. It's on you if you don't want to drop it right now. And he's just standing there, not letting it go. I've seen this happen so many times, the, the classic standoff in prison. Because at this point, they are stuck. They are paralyzed by their egos. They don't know what to do. You know, it's like a staring contest. The first one that, that, that looks away is a bitch. But it, the stakes are much higher. Um, you know, it's very complicated because if he hits them and a riot pops off, he's going to get hurt by the white people for starting a riot over something stupid when they said that they would drop it and vice versa. Same thing can happen with the Mexicans. But at the same time, you don't want to show your posture and then be the one to back down. Very, very complicated. Eventually, he just kind of looks at me. He's like, let's get the fuck out of here. We walk away. It scared me. I'm still in that point in my prison career. Now, I had PTSD when I came out the first time. During my five-year term, I came out and I was noticeably different. I was more jealous. I was more controlling. Um, I was more... I had separation anxiety. And I had, excuse me, I had an anger outburst. And it affected me for sure. When I got out, people said that I was different. I mean, I was different physically too. I was in like really good shape. I'd been lifting weights, but the way that I carried myself was different as well. You know, I had confidence because in prison, when you meet somebody, you shake their hand, you look them in the eyes, and that's just how you're schooled on how to meet someone. You squeeze their hand hard, like, you know, it's some manly shit. And then you do it out here on the free world and like you hear someone's fucking hand crunch and you're like, ugh. People out here aren't like that. The bravado that exists in prison is not out in the free world. It's just it's just how it is. Um, and in that particular situation, I had no other choice but to back him up simply because he was white. This is a guy I knew for two or three days starting a race riot because uh, Southsider was standing behind his friend on the elliptical. Think about that. Think about how ridiculous that sounds. That's the kind of thing people get murdered over in prison. And I still had fear at that point. You know, I, this was my second term. It didn't really go away until halfway through my third that I just got out. Now I'm fearless. But you need to understand something. Being fearless doesn't mean that I'm not paranoid. I'm hyper paranoid. If I'm walking down the street, my best friend and I walk all the time. Anybody, a car comes by, because we walk late at night, anybody's walking, I start getting spooked. I'm like, hey, I think they're plotting on us. You know, and he's like, um, I think that you're a weirdo with prison PTSD. You were never like this before. I think everyone's plotting on us. We can see 16 year old kids, and I'm like, dude. Dude, what if they, you know, think about all the school shootings that happen. Kids that age are capable of, of violence too. Why should we not be cautious about them? It's just like, that is an absurd, absurd way of looking at it, Ryan. You're completely out there. And I, I, you know, I'm me, so I can't see this stuff. But this is actually how I think. I'm not making a joke of this. This is actually how I think. And we didn't get in a riot. And Jamie Lake is back to giving me the little 15 milligram morphines. Now, for any of you that have done 15 milligram morphines, they to inject them, it is a big hassle. You have to crush it up. You have to cook it on a can. You have to make a little wax candle, whatever. Um, and it just takes forever. And then the binky, you know, the binky, we've talked about this. This is a insulin syringe that you put like in a plastic pen. And then you put like a rubber neck on it so you can squeeze the – it's like a makeshift syringe. Those things clog all the time, and then it's like you're trying to do one shot. It takes hours to unclog it, and it's just a hassle. Morphine clogs binkies more than heroin. You know, heroin doesn't do that like – like morphine reliably does because you have the buffer and all of that stuff. So I start looking 
at other drugs and I start seeing what's going on at this prison. Now I'm taking the morphine and I'm like, you know, because I'm extorting the guy for this. I'm making him get me stored. I'm making him do stuff for me. And around this time, I start talking to this guy named Tom. Now he's not the Tom from, there was my celly in Victorville. Well, I'm mad. He's not that guy. He's the, he was at Victorville at the same time. So him and I instantly become road dogs at this prison and we would walk laps. We would burn laps is what we would say. And we just walk around and talk about everything. And, you know, he's telling me how happy he was to be at Lompoc versus Victorville. And I say, Hey man, do you remember Jamie Lake? And he's like, he just looks at me and kind of rolls his eyes. And I'm like, Oh, you know, he's a check in too. And he's like, I didn't know that, but I can't stand the motherfucker. I was like, yeah, dude. And I tell him the whole story about how I vouched for him and how he rolled it up and how I took like a $400 loss. And he's like, wow. Now, this guy had very skewed prison politics, okay? So in prison, you're considered a piece of shit if you're a child molester. We call them chomos. That's our little cute pet name for them. Rats, you know, anyone that cooperate on their case that we have paperwork on. It's very hard to put that on somebody if you don't have the paperwork and people that roll it up over debt those are like the three criteria that you're a turd in prison you know and this guy tom is like spouting out the most ass backward shit i've ever heard you know first of all he's a racist so he's like he's like fuck it you know i say i say we run up bills with the mexicans and we just fucking don't pay them fuck them mexicans um, but Tom, then aren't we a piece of shit? Not if they're Mexican. That was like his complete logic to everything, right? And I'm just like, Tom, 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 be reasonable. He's like, oh, the Mexican $1,700 fucking dollar, U.S. dollars. I'm not paying them shit. Fucking immigrants, they all got AIDS. Tom, they don't have AIDS. Goddamn right they do. And then he starts, you know, quoting... I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go political. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But this guy was very racist, but I knew him from Victorville. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, Jesus, this guy owes $1,700 for drugs to the Mexicans? Maybe I shouldn't be walking with him, you know? But that was like the only person I really knew. So we start, you know, I'm like, I'm like, well, what's up with the drugs here? Like, you know, where's the heroin? And I'm telling him that I'm extorting late. You know, I'm like, well, this is my plan. I'm like, I'm extorting him. I'm going home in about 60 days. I tell him what, what my ex-wife did. And uh, I'm going to extort him, and then I'm going to beat him up the last day. And I'm going to tell everyone that he's a check-in. And, and he's like, you know, you know, Tom's all into it. He's like, yeah, 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 fuck that dude. Hey, put my debt on him. <laughs> we'll say that he owed me the $1,700, so the Mexicans think that he's the fucking piece of shit. Fucking Mexicans. I'm like, yeah, dude. <laughs> Stay down, Wood. I got you, man. Like, you know, I'm like, I'm a, some accomplice to his, like, PC shit, you know? It's what, this is when my political stuff just started, like, I was just disillusioned by the whole prison political structure. You know, it's like, yeah, 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 I'm not. I'm not going to do time with child molesters. Fuck that. No, I'm not programming with those pieces of shit. Really? But, like, you can look him up on a sex offender registry when you're out. I don't see you knocking on their door and smashing him off the neighborhood. So you're programming him with them at a house where your fucking kids live? On the same neighborhood, but you can't do time with them? Makes a lot of sense. And, 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 and don't forget about the Mexicans, either. What about them? They all got AIDS. Mexican? Okay. All right, so. I'm in my head talking to Tom, but you know, this is right when my political beliefs in prison started to, I'm like, wait, a, wait a second. I don't know. I feel like I may have been lied to. I don't know. I don't know. Wait, so, ooh, let me get this straight. If I'm good at this, I get to stay at this place forever. Dude, I'm going to be as best at this as I can be, dude, for sure. Oh, you want me to beat someone up arbitrarily? Let's go. It's like this, right? And this is going to get later in the story, but this is a good example of this. And I'm just saying, this is the this is the term where it really started not to make sense to me anymore, the whole political shit, because it's so, so hypocritical. 
okay, so a lot of white guys in prison are Odinists, right? They have, like, uh, I don't know what the Odinists, but, like, Odinists is, like, a Viking uh, theology where, you know, it's, like, Thor and, like, different, like, uh, Viking uh, deities or whatever, I think. I don't even know. But, like, a lot of white guys in prison are Odinist, Odinistic. And at this particular prison, they had a, like, an Odinist, like, you know, worship area with, like, it was, like, looked like a little garden with pebbles and with, like, a statue. And, like, anytime I'd be there, they'd be, like, like, I'd be, like, sitting there, you know, my shirt off. And, like, you know, I'd be talking. You know how I am. I'm, like, bouncing my knee and, like, periodically I'd spit. Hey, brother, do not disrespect our area of worship. I'm like, what do you mean? You you just you just spit on our altar. I'm like, oh dude, 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 dude. I am so sorry. I didn't even realize it. The next day, those same guys are sitting there shooting crystal meth in the little area of their worship or whatever. So spitting's disrespectful, but you can slam fucking shit that was made in a bathtub. You can inject drugs, but you can't spit. And that's like just a good example of the hypocrisy of this place. But I start talking to Tom and I'm like, well, what's up with drugs? Now, I've already gone into this a little bit. Suboxone was flooded. That was the new thing. People were sending Suboxone in. People were hitting it at visit. And they were going for a lot of money. One strip, if you break it down, is worth $320. And people are like, that's not true. Will a little piece even get you loaded? Yeah. Yep. When, you're not, when you don't have a habit, it will. And what people would do, the weirdest things I would ever see, these guys would get these little papers, they call them papers, that's any sack of drugs in prison. They'd open this little paper with Suboxone in it, take it out, this little teeny piece, and they'd open their eye and put it in like it was a contact lens. And I'm like, um, why don't you just put it under your tongue? And they're like, nah, bro, you feel it more this way. And I'm like, I don't know, that's pretty hardcore, dude. Like, what if that makes you go blind? And they're like, so... And they just do it. Yeah, I swear to God. I swear they did that. And it was bizarre to me. Or sometimes they bring a chapstick, like a thing of chapstick out to the yard. They'd put the Suboxone in there, add it with a little water, and it would dissolve. And they put it, um, you know, they'd roll it down their nose, just like you would do with heroin. And then people would inject it. Suboxone was the new craze. So is smoking spice. But smoking spice is like you know, I've never really, sativa weed has never really agreed with me. I like indica much more. Sativa makes me get in my head. Um, spice, K2, is reliably a bad trip in that direction. Like, you start getting over-analytical, you know? Uh, you start thinking about how many dicks my ex-wife is sucking right at that minute. At the same time, like six of them. She's like one of those people that would stick multiple ones in her mouth. And she was way into that. Like, you know. Not to deviate from the story, but, like, we'd be watching porn on the iPad, you know, and we'd have, like, Pornhub on. I'd be fucking her doggy style. I'd be like, what do you want to watch? And she's like, let's watch gangbang porn. I'm like, dude, all right. I'd, like, put it on. I'm like, I guess. And we're watching it. And she would be so into it. And I'm like, I'm like, you know, if you're into this, if this is what you like watching, I wonder, like, what you're doing while I'm in prison. She's probably taking on the bottom tier of my apartment complex because that's what kind of chick she was for. She was, she's one of the most scandalous women I've ever been around. And she disgusted me and she disgusts me to this day. Um, but I asked Tom, I'm like, are there real drugs here? He's like, yeah, there's meth here. There's heroin. Um, but it's expensive. You know, a hundred dollars worth of heroin at this place was about the size of the pinky nail. And it was thin. It was like a, it was, it was like thinned out and you could get high off of like twice. Once if you want to be really high, twice if you want to feel it pretty good two different times. So he's like, I can introduce you to this guy. There's one guy in the whole yard that sells heroin because everybody's doing Suboxone because it's a better bang for your buck. And I'm like, you think he would um, take morphine? And he's like, nah, you know, that, that people don't like morphine because you get so much, like you can spend, what was it? For the paper of Suboxone, I think it started at that place for like $10, 15 10 or $15. If you spent like $25 on a Suboxone paper, you got like a decent, you know, you got probably like a little more than a 16th of a Suboxone strip. And that would get you loaded. Like if you put that down your nose, you'd be high. 
uh, the morphine, you shoot a 15 milligram, it doesn't really do anything. It's, it's kind of bullshit, you know? It's kind of like, man, you know, I wish I was extorting someone that had heroin or something, not this bullshit, but I was thinking maybe I could still make money, but it really wasn't worth much. Um, so I have Tom set up a little meeting where I can talk to this guy, and his name is Kong. And he's not a Southsider, he's a Paisa, but he looks just like a Southsider. He, like, he has a shaved head, and he has like really um, crazy tattoo work, what's called a helmet, all over, you know, he's just black, he looks like a convict. Looks like a Southsider, but he can't speak English. And so Tom sets up um, an introduction with this guy. Now he's like a pretty big guy, and he has like another like Paisa with him that's translating. And my friend Tom's like, yeah, you know, uh, his, his money's good. And, you know, the Pais is translating it to, to Kong. And Kong's just, like, nodding, you know. And we're walking the lap and, uh, you know, on the track. And I ask him if I can get 100 paper. And he said, how are you going to pay for it? And, of course, the Pais is translating this to him. And I say, hey, my parents are coming to visit me in a week. I can do a send-out. Meaning when my parents come visit me, I was planning on telling my parents, hey, instead of putting money on my books, can you put money on this other inmate's books? I owe money and I was buying stamps, whatever. You know, um, my parents generally would do that, even though they weren't putting money on my books at this point. But I was just, it's dope fiend optimism. Oh, I'll figure it out tomorrow. Huh, who cares if I could get killed over this? I just want to get loaded now. And that's really how I always operated. Not a good look in prison. It's very hard to be considered a solid inmate when you are operating on that level. Um, and if you don't have people that are sending you money, then it tends to go bad for you. You know, you're either rolling it up or, you know, your words poo-poo when everyone says that, you know, and it affects you in any area. You're like, you're like, hey, Brad, um, you want to play basketball at three o'clock today? Nah, bro, your words poo-poo. And they won't even play basketball with you. So it affects drugs, it affects your recreation. Every aspect of your good quality of life in prison is affected if your reputation is tainted in any way by you being a liar or having a bad word. So it's a very big deal to not have a bad word in, in jail so you can play basketball with Brad. Um... So we work it out where he agrees to front me the heroin, $100 worth. He brings it out to me. Um, I'm like, all right, cool. Now that morning, I'd already done um, a Suboxone, I think. I think I'd done a Suboxone. Yeah, Tom had a piece, and he blessed me with one, something like that. And I felt it, you know? And I was like, I don't even want these morphines. Maybe I'll just save them up so I can get really loaded, you know? The little 15 milligrams not doing much, which is surprising because a little piece of Suboxone would. You would think morphine would affect you more, more than that. Suboxone um, has a higher affinity. So, you know, a small amount can actually get you there. So I'm like, well, I'm going to wait until the following day to do the heroin because I had taken the Suboxone. And I had it all set up where I was going to do the send out when I went to see my parents and visit. <clears throat> so, you know, Jamie's still giving me his morphine and, you know, every time I'm with him, I'm like, you know, I'm like, thanks, man. You're a bitch. I'm like saying it loud enough where like people are like, and next morning, uh, I'm walking laps with Tom and, you know, I'm like, the binky that I had been using in my unit had broken. So I'm asking him if he had another one. So this always creates a big issue in prison. Um, if you have a binky or if you have a syringe and it breaks and you, you're like an IV heroin user, you have to figure out a way to use somebody else's binky. Now, a lot of times, you know, um, there's not more than one binky in a unit. So I had to go all the way to yard, find Tom, talk to Tom. Remember, it's controlled movement. Then an hour has to go by. He has to go back inside tell the person that has the rig to come out, you know, oh, hey, dude, be sure to tell him to bring something that we can wash it out with, like bleach or something, so I don't get, you know, communicable diseases. And of course, nobody ever brings that. They just bring the rig, and you're like, fuck it, and you just do it anyway, which is horrible. And then you're thinking, you're tripping on it for like years afterwards. You're like, oh my God, 
cannot believe I shared with that guy. Um, it's crazy in prison. I mean, you're passing it around like it's a joint. You know, it's a bloody rig. It's so I am cannot. I'm so grateful um, that I only have Hep C. You know, and if you don't, you're a cop. Anyway, um, so I'm talking to Tom, and he's saying that he can get me the unit. I forget what the guy's name was, but it was a white guy that had it. And as we're walking the laps, I see the black dude that's my neighbor that had given me the Cortezes. And, you know, he's like, he's like, what up, Leone? I was like, hey, what's up? I give him the peace sign, the Facebook shit, you know? I'm like, and Tom's like, he's like, you know that? black guy he said something more disrespectful he's like we're friends with that so and such and such i'm like well, i mean he's my neighbor he gave me these shoes he's like you know who that is i'm like no he's like that's big meech okay i don't know who that is big meech who's that and he starts telling me about him so i guess i forget what his name was dimitri he introduced himself not as meech he introduced himself as whatever his real name was i forget what it is dimitri or something like that and he introduced me as his real name. And so Tom's telling me about who Big Meech is. And, you know, I mentioned when I had met him in the last video, and I seen in, I saw in the comments that a lot of people didn't know who that was. They're like, well, who is Big Meech? And then there were people like, you should explain who that is. Big Meech um, is a guy that I hadn't heard of before, you know. Um, but to be fair, I'd been, you know, on drugs for a lot of the time that, that he was in the news and when documentaries were coming out about him and who he was, I believe he was from Atlanta uh, originally. He got busted in Florida, I want to say. I think he told me he got busted in Florida. I don't, I don't know. And I saw a documentary after I got out. But um, he was one of the, allegedly, not saying he did it, he allegedly is one of the biggest cocaine dealers generation he's like his generation's boston george um or you know some of those guys from the cocaine cowboys or freeway ricky ross he was like the latest carnation of that and he started allegedly um black mafia family bmf and what that is is i mean he like started a lot of hip-hop guys careers supposedly you know, they say he started Young Jeezy's, T.I., a bunch of people. You know, he was just making so much money that he started, you know, exploring other avenues for revenue. And one of those was hip-hop. Now, there's, a, there's a, a very, very, very long history of, you know, drug dealers starting hip-hop labels. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Uh, my good friend, Seth Ferrante, who's Nico's godfather, um, he did 21 years in the feds. I'll have him on here sometime. He's, he's an amazing guy. He's got a great story. He's a vice journalist, writes for Huffington Post, Don Diva, um, Penthouse. He's the one that covered me in, in Huffington Post and Penthouse. But he wrote a great book called Street Legends, and it traces some of the origin stories of like these street legends from like the 80s and 90s. He has multiple volumes. It's called Street Legends. It's on Amazon. It's amazing. But, you know, I guess Big Meech had gotten so big that he had bought a billboard just like in Scarface. In Scarface, there's that scene, I think it's on a blimp, or maybe it says it on a building, or it says the world is yours. I don't remember. I cannot remember right now. Um, but he had bought a billboard that said that, and he said, the world is yours, brought to you by Black Mafia family. Some cold-ass gangster shit. And, you know, when I... I, I mean, I didn't realize how big he was. And Tom's like, yeah, like that guy's like running this spot for the black. He didn't really say it that nicely, but you know what I mean? This is the information he was giving me. And when I got out of prison, like, you know, when I first time I met Freeway Ricky Ross, when I went over to his house, I was talking, you know, Seth had brought me over there and we go to Freeway's house and, you know, Freeway was talking about, about Big Meech. It was like one of the first names that came up he was just talking about him and kind of updating me about where he was i think at the time he was on diesel therapy or maybe he's in arizona yeah, i know he got caught with the phone supposedly and i was like yeah i was i was locked up with big meech and, and free was like really i was like yeah i was in lompoc with him he's like i was like i was in there 
early 2017. He's like, yeah, that's right. He was there. I was like, yeah. He was my neighbor. He gave me Nikes for free. I was like, wow, that's what a small world. It's trippy. Um, I didn't realize what level he was on, but I did time with him. You know, he was there at that time. And he was nice to me. And he liked me. I liked him. And uh, I really hope that he gets out soon. So, Tom goes, gets this guy. This guy comes back, and he brings the rig. Now, we go to some table, and he brought, like, a spoon. He brought this little, like, spork, which is like a spoon and a fork combined. It's in plastic. Brings one of those out to the table, and he takes, you know, I take the, I have the heroin, so I take my little bit. It's like in a little plastic. It's, like, tied up in plastic, and there's, like, a piece of paper folded on it. I take it out, and now we had talked about this last time. When you do drugs with somebody in prison and they let you use their rig or their binky, it's common prison etiquette to give them drops. Drops. Not like, hey, dude, can I get a dime? It's like, can I get two drops of your fucking binky? Because they drop like – it's if you get a Visine bottle and you just drop it and you see the drops come out, that's like what – that's what I'm talking about. Two – Visine drops worth of heroin. And like people fight about that. No, 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 that's my drop. No, he said I could have the drop. And you're like, dude, that's not gonna do anything. It's not even a head change, bro. And people like people like kill people over their drops. You know, there's like drop parades. Straight up. Drop conventions. People that collect drops from all okay, I'm just fucking around. But so anyway, so I'm he brings the spork, um, they brought some water out, and he brought a Q tip. And, you know, in prison, sometimes you'll cook it on a can, but usually what you do is you just put the heroin on the spoon, add a little bit of water, and you just get a pen cap or something that you can stir it with, and you just keep stirring the black tar. And eventually it's going to liquefy. It's going to turn into brown liquid or, you know, dark blackish liquid because heroin, all kinds of heroin, um, is, li is water soluble. So, you know, the reason that, that most people cook heroin, like on a spoon or a can, is because it expedites the process, you know? You're not going to find a junkie that's going, you know, like, it goes scores on Skid Row, and they get to their car, and they're like, all right, give me a pen cap, dude. I'm going to stir this. Yeah, right, dude. You're just going to get a lighter. And <sighs> cool. Like, it takes 10 seconds. You're, like, still slamming it while the water's, like, boiling hot in the stir. It doesn't even matter. You want to do it quick. In prison, it takes forever. You learn patience. You're stirring it, stirring it, stirring it. We draw it up, and, um, you know, they're like, do you know how to use a binky? Now, everybody's there because they want drops, you know? Like, for the most ridiculous reason. Dude, dude, I, who gave you your coffee mug when you got here? Who gave you your plastic coffee mug? Me, bro. Don't forget about me when you're doing those drops. There's people I don't know. There's like some random Native American in line. I'm like, what the fuck? Everybody just wants a handout because like nobody buys heroin at this spot. It's like a luxury item, you know? And like I gave uh, the dude who had the syringe and I gave Tom um, a couple drops. And I did a big old issue. And, you know, I'm trying to hit myself. Binkies are hard to, they're not, okay, they're, they're easier to hit with because you don't have to pull the plunger and like, you know, find blood and then push it back in and like kind of balance the needle in there. With a binky, you just stick the needle in in this little crackle of blood. It almost looks like a thin, you know, uh, like a string of blood will go through the, the, the plastic pen. That's how you know that you're into a vein. You know, it doesn't, you know, blossom and like flower out like with a lot of blood like you would in a normal insulin syringe. It's just like, these little, it's like a little thread of red that's, you know, and then you just, like, you stick it in and you just bend the rubber. And by bending the, like, by turning the rubber and bending it, it pushes the dope into your vein. Um, some people have it down, like, they can do it like that. You know, some people prefer being pieces. I, I mean, I can go either way. But at this point, my veins were pretty beat up. And so I'm trying to hit, trying to hit, trying to hit on my leg. We're just on a table. There's like, you know, it's ridiculous. You see guys like jogging with like headbands on. They're like waving at us. And we're just like trying to hit our neck with this little binky. 
eventually I had to hit my neck. And like, even though I've hit my neck a lot of times, I still have like a really good, let's see if I can get it, it should be right there. And, uh, you know, so I'm like sitting there holding my breath and I hate that. I hate that. You know, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it hurts for one. I mean, I think I'm just like, I think I'm just a little bitch when it comes to shooting up anyway. I just don't like it. I've never liked how it feels, but in the neck, I hate the feeling of holding my breath. Like, you know, just holding it. And a binky is even more hardcore. People like are like stabbing it like it's a dart or something. So I'm holding my neck and someone finally hits me. Just, you know, I'm like, mm. it's not like I can be like, oh, are you in? Are you in? Because as soon as you talk, then it deflates and it messes up the whole process. So I'm just, you know, holding my breath, hoping that this guy is going to squeeze the heroin into it. And he does, and I barely feel it. A little ass rush. I'm like, like, you know, normal heroin rush, pins and needles. You know, you get a... You should feel a decent rush off it. I didn't get that on this one. It wasn't like that. And they're all looking at me. Is it good? Dude, let me get the cotton. No, 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 I want the cotton. And I'm like, dude, that shit's whack. It's not even good. It's bunk. Can I still get those drops, bro? Like, it didn't do, I did like $60 worth. They didn't do anything to me. What the hell? This is bunk drugs. And, um. You know, then they, they're all fighting over their scraps. Just absurd stuff. It's like placebo at that point, you know? Sorry, I'm like getting thirsty. And uh, so we go back to the unit. Now, we go back to the unit and, you know, I, um, I check my mail. You know, there, there's always a list with who has packages, you know, who has a book or a magazine or a or a letter that says that I have a book and my dad had sent me a copy of Wasting Talent, a book that I wrote. Now, I wrote that book on my first term. Now I'm back in prison and he sent it back. No one knew that I wrote books. I don't go around like advertising that at this place. At least I didn't at that time. I definitely did in later years. I, I regret that because people, you know, well, what do you think? You're better than us? I'm just like, no, I just told you I wrote a book. They're like, what do you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whew. Fuck, that dude's arrogant, man. <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm just telling you, like, what I do. Like, if I said I was in construction, you wouldn't say that. Why Why is this living different than what you do? Like, and I never think that I'm better than anyone. I'm not. I've been to prison three times. I've been a heroin addict for 20 years. What the fuck do I know about life? Seriously. I'm obviously doing something wrong. But I remember the first person that I showed the book to was Meech. I brought it up to Big Meech. I'm like, look. I wrote this in prison. And he was like, damn, that's cool. I think just being nice. Probably didn't think that was cool. But you think it's cool if someone's like, look at this book I wrote. And you're like doing 30 years. You'd be like, who gives a fuck, you know? He's talking to like T.I. on the phone all the time. He didn't care about my book. He was the first one that I showed it to, and he was nice enough about it. And then I started showing other people. And, you know, people were like, let me get dibs on this. And I'm like, all right. And that, you know, that tends to happen. And then everyone starts reading it. And then... You know, people come up to me and be like, dude, the pocket butthole, oh, you're a freak, man. We should sell up together, dog. And I'm like, what? They always think that I'm like some weirdo because of stuff that I wrote. But now that guy that, remember I told you was um, the, the duplex guy, you know, the guy that was savoring the cream of the duplex. Now he started imposing more rules and weirdo shit, like. You know, because I still had half of that paper. I still had heroin left. And I go in there and I'm like, hey, man, um, just out of respect, do you care if um, if I get loaded in here? Because the guy that had the binky let me let me hold on to it. It's just scary going through the metal detector with the syringe because sometimes they'll give you, like, extra time for that. You know, I was doing a violation, so I didn't have good time to lose. But it's still the kind of thing where you don't want to get caught with a syringe. That can be a... DA referral, you know, they can like send that to the FBI and the FBI can press charges on you for having a syringe because it, you know, it's a vehicle for communicable diseases and overdoses. It's dangerous. It compromises the safety of the institution. I, excuse me, I completely see where they're coming from with that. Um, 
but I tell myself, I'm like, hey, um, I want to be respectful, and you know, um, do you care if I shoot heroin in here? He's like, are you crazy? I'm like, so I can't? He's like, no way, man, no way. I get out in a week, you're not fucking that up. I'm like, how would that fuck your time up with me shooting heroin? What do you think I'm going to do? A cop's going to come in here? I'm going to be like, dude, he's making me do this. What are you talking about? He's like, no. No, man. Listen, if you do heroin in here, I can't guarantee there aren't. there's not going to be consequences. I'm like, what the hell is that supposed to mean? It's like, you know what, dude? I don't need, I'm, I'm cool. I'm gone. I was like so spooked. I'm like, what's he what is he saying? Saying if... He's going to, like, tell on me or something. So, anyway, I go in another cell, and I do it. And um, in this unit, I'm starting to play poker a lot. Um, Jamie Lake is in his cell more often than he used to be, is what people are telling me. And I'm starting to slowly put it out there. You know, I meet Tom. I run into a, a couple other people that I knew from Victorville. And, you know, whenever we're talking privately, I'm like, hey, this is what it is. I'm extorting this dude, but... Like, if anything happens to me, you guys need to roll this dude out. You need to pack him out. He, he did this to me. You know, like, I'm a good white guy. Good white guy. Anyway, this is what I thought at this point in my life, anyway. So, um, you know, I was mad about the heroin, for sure. Like, super mad about the heroin. And, you know, I, I did $100 worth in a day, and I didn't feel it. So, I was like telling Tom, I'm like, look, man, I'm, I'm not trying to pay Kong. Fuck that fool, man. Fuck that Mexican. Don't pay him. Tell him no, because he's Mexican. Tell him that shit. I got your back. This guy's like 60 years old with glasses, like, and he like walks with a limp. It's like my only backup here, and he's telling me to do stuff like this. I'm like, look, Tom, I just want you to bring him to me. And we need to talk with one of those translator guys. And I need to tell him that that, the dope's, the dope's bunk. I shouldn't have to pay for that. Why should I have to pay $100 for dope that didn't get me off? So finally we arranged like a little meeting and he comes up to me and, you know, I'm telling the Pais, I'm like, look, tell him this. Say the Chiva that I did is no good. Basuta, trash, no bueno. And he's, he's... You know, you can just see Kong. It seriously looks like smoke steaming out of his ears. He's just like, and he just starts like, you know, doing this crazy um, Spanish, like where you know he's mad. Like, you know, I don't even, I can't even imitate it. It's just angry Spanish. You can tell it's he's mad. He's like stomping on stuff. I'm like, Jesus, dude, what's he saying? Pice is like, hold on, he's not done. And I'm like, what the fuck, like. How much can you possibly say? And he's like, well, um, he says that you're the only person that's complained about the heroin and that he's calling you a liar, um, that you're a liar and that your words poo poo. And that if you don't pay him, he's going to go to the guy that has the keys for the yard. I forget what his name was. He was really cool though. I think his name was Tommy, Tommy, something like that. It's a really nice guy. Um, he was from like, I don't know, Northern California. Very level-headed, though. You know, definitely the kind of person you want to be running a yard. Um, but this Pice is telling me, like, hey, like, if you don't pay him the 100 bucks, he's going to bring it to Tommy or whoever. And, uh, yeah, you're probably going to get stabbed. But So you should probably just pay him. And I'm like, well, that's pretty persuasive. Okay, I'll just pay him. And Tom's like, man, you really bitched out to that Mexican, man. I'm like, shut the fuck up, Tom. How long have you been in prison? He's like, 27 years. I'm like, yeah, dude, I'm not listening to you. Whatever. Go back into the unit. I'm all mad, you know, like Kong got over on me. And I remember getting on the phone to call my wife. Having a bad time at prison, although at least I didn't get in a riot. Um, the morphine that Jamie Lake's giving me is pretty bunk. And I'm just doing what I can to get loaded you know, on Suboxone. It's the only reliable thing that gets me high. I'm saving up morphines and I'm trading them to people for little, like, scraps of Suboxone. Anyway, I call my wife and uh, and she's telling me that she, um, 
she starts, well, okay, first of all, we've been emailing every day. I, I did, hadn't mentioned that yet. And the thing that she told me before this call is that she was moving, that she can't pay rent anymore and that she's moving. And I'm like, what? She's like, just call me on my lunch break today. So I ended up calling her that day after Monk, after um, Kong had, had checked my ass. And I end up calling her and she picks up. She's like, hello. I'm like, listen, what do you mean you're not paying rent? She's like, I can't afford it anymore. I'm like, why not? She's like, I tried to get a new place, and this black guy, <laughs> he ran a scam on me. And I'm like, what does that mean? And she's like, I gave him $4,000, and he left. I was like, how does that even happen? What do you mean? And apparently she had, like, answered some Craigslist ad. She's like a Craigslist superstar. And some, like, black, some random black guy in L.A. was like, yeah, I am. Uh, I have an apartment that I'm renting, and there's no doubt, there's no security deposit. I just need four thousand dollars, and uh, I'll give you an extra month for free. Some bullshit. It wasn't even his place. But I just had the key to it. You know, some scam like we had talked about, which I thought might be a good idea. Now it's coming back to get her. So I guess she had given him four thousand. She had been planning the escape. Well, yeah, fuck paying my rent. Fuck my credit. Thanks. You know, and she had given this guy money, and then he ghosted her. Phone straight to voicemail. She got jacked for 4000 And I'm just like, I'm like, oh, honey, I'm so sorry that happened to you secretly. I'm like, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I hope you suffer out there. The only thing, I don't want the kid to suffer, but, like, she deserves anything like this. It is straight karma coming back to her. Apparently, she got jacked, and she wasn't going to be able to pay the rent anymore, and she's on heroin, and she's like, and I had been putting a lot of thought into it. I said, you know what? I've been putting a lot of thought into our relationship. You're right. Because she'd sent me an email and she's like, these are the things that are wrong with you. Oh, number one, you are such a drug addict. Number two, you're the dirtiest person I've ever lived with. Number three, you're lying. You telling me that you're going to the doctor and then you're gone for five hours. This is what I'm reading off the email. I can just hear this bitch's voice. You know, I can just, that's, it's so ingrained in me. Ugh. But she wrote me this list of like 20 things that if I changed those, you know, um, she'd give me another chance. It's like fucking terrorist hostage demands. Like all these, cr well, you need to switch from menthol to regular cigarettes. It's like, What? She hates the smell of cigarettes, but if I stop smoking menthol, that's so, just way out stuff, right? And so I'm like, listen, I've been putting a lot of thought into it, and I think that you're absolutely right. And she's like, what do you mean? I think you're right. I think that um, we're no good for each other. That I, You're right. I'm a heroin addict. I'm a piece of shit. Um, I'm an alcoholic, um, messy, I'm a liar, I'm a cheater, uh, I'm a manipulator, and I'm not good for your son. I was like, the fact that you that there's a child involved is the point that I need to walk away from. You're right. And I'm not selfish enough anymore where I'm going to try to make apples out of oranges and I'm going to make this relationship out of something that it never was. We got married. I was living on my friend's couch. I was out of material to write about. And I was like, dude, I should marry this crazy fan that sent me a letter. And like, we're taking bong loads. And Jeff's like, yeah, sounds cool. He was joking, but I'm not, I wasn't because I'm a psycho and I really married her. And now I'm in this situation. I'm like, we should have never gotten married to begin with. Not when you have a when you have a five year old kid. It's not fair to him. It's a toxic relationship. So you're right, and I'm gonna walk away. And she's like, Oh my god, you're breaking up with me. It's like I'm not. You're the one that wanted to separate, but you get to fuck other people. I'm fucking a rolled up mattress, thinking about you fucking other people. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, I mean, you're the one that brought up separating first. And she's like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh. She's like, 
<laughs> you're doing this to me now. I'm like, what do you mean? You, you're not paying rent. You send me $10 after I took risks for you and sent you three grand. What do you mean? And she's like, I'm pregnant. And I'm like, what? What'd you just say? And all I hear is sniffling. <laughs> I'm like, did you just say you're pregnant? Hello? Dial tone. And we will get into what's about to happen with all of that in the next installment of my second time in federal prison. Certainly appreciate everybody that watches my content. Like, subscribe, comment. Check out patreon.com slash Ryan Leone. Love, light, and 